welcome to the fourth lecture of the 20th um, uh, Le Fever uh, Winter Series on Aging. This lecture series um, honors the memory of Dr. Edward James Le Fever, uh, who was a Gallison physician with a passion for geriatric medicine. But before I introduce today's speaker, uh, I would like to uh, leave the podium for a couple of minutes to Dr. Donald Lefevre, who is uh, Dr. Edward Lefevre's grandson and is an advocate for the advancement of integrative medicine. Well, thank you so much. Uh, happy Mardi Gras to everyone. It's Fat Tuesday. And my name is Donald James Lefevre, as she said. It excites me, my family, myself to continue to have these Lefebvre lecture series as an ongoing tradition here at UTMB. We're grateful for the time and energy of all those responsible for continuing this tradition. And so i um, like to take the time and any, every, anyone that's a part of the CLE Center on Aging or just a part of putting the lecture, could you just raise your hand so we can just acknowledge your work and everything that you do? And then there's also Stephanie outside, and uh, she's one of the coordinators, and um, actually got in contact with her earlier today. And so I also like to mention that the Sealy Center on Aging has been very hospitable to me for the past two years and has invited me to share research that I've done with acupuncture and oriental medicine and integrative medicine here in their research symposium. And I'd like to thank Dr. Elena Volpe, and then Dr. Goodwin, and Dr. Anthony Dinuzzo, because that was great to be able to share with others from the American acupuncture and oriental medicine tradition, which I just graduated and studied this past year. And it's a privilege to be here tonight to represent the Lefebvre family, to help honor the memory and legacy that was left by my grandfather, Dr. Edward James Lefebvre. And this is the 20th anniversary, and I know that he is smiling today knowing that his principles that he lived for being celebrated and carried forth in the enterprises here at UTMB with the lecture series that he has. His morals and his ethics that he lived by continually inspire us in the way that we live our lives, and also they serve as a constant reminder to the way that medicine, it's intended to be practiced. I've heard countless stories about the kindness and compassion that he shared with his patients, and that even after so many years, to this day, you know, they still remain in his memory, or he remains in their memory. And so at this time, I'd like just for anyone that knew him personally or knew of his legacy, if they could just please stand up or raise their hand so we can see you. All front row seat tickets right there. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much again for affording me this opportunity, and may we all keep in our heart, mind, and spirit his memory. And so now I'd like to turn over the mic, and let's give our full attention to tonight's feature lecture from Dr. Robert Wallace. Thank you, thank you. very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lefevre. Very nice of you. Um, Today, uh, I have the pleasure uh, of introducing Dr. Robert Wallace, um, a world-renowned authority in epidemiology and disease prevention in older adults. Dr. Wallace is the director of the Center on Aging and a professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Iowa. Um, he has a medical degree from Northwestern University Medical School in Chicago and a master's degree from the um, uh, State University of New York in Buffalo. He also did his residency training in internal medicine at Cornell University Hospitals and started his academic career at Emory University at the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, um, um, but then went uh, a, a couple of years later to the University of Iowa where he rapidly moved up in the academic career ladder from instructor all the way to full professor. And he's been focusing his research uh, over this, uh, 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 the years on um, chronic disease, on, on epidemiology of diseases and conditions linked to aging, um, with a focus on chronic diseases, cognition, and disability. His research has been funded by a number of large NIH grants, and he's been involved in uh, all major epidemiological studies done in the United States. 
um, in older adults and has been tremendously productive with almost 500 uh, peer-reviewed publications in high-impact journals um, and also numerous book chapters and review articles. He's also involved, um, among the other things, in the STRIDE study, which is a multi-center uh, clinical trial on fall prevention in the elder, in which we are also involved, and so we participate in the same uh, teleconferences together. Um, and, uh, but most importantly, th uh, throughout his career, Dr. Wallace has trained a, num a number of very successful junior investigators, and uh, for his successes in his career, uh, um, uh, accomplishment, Dr. Wallace has received a number of honors and awards. Uh, among this, uh, he's been elected as a member at the uh, Institute of Medicine in 2001, and in 2011 he has received the Institute of Medicine Distinguished Service Award, the Walsh McDermott Medal. These are uh, they, uh, there are also many more accomplishments, uh, but for the lack of time, I cannot include them in this brief presentation, but if you're uh, curious, they're contained in the CV, which is like a book, is uh, 122 pages long. So please um, uh, join me to welcome Dr. Uh, Robert Wallace, who will talk about brain health. And uh, thank you to the Lefebvre family, and uh, thank you also to my friends and colleagues who keep bringing me down here and rescuing me from the frozen north, and uh, uh, so I really appreciate it. Uh, in fact, uh, Professor Marquides was uh, reminiscing last night that uh, I may have first come down here in 1992 and probably have been down 15 times, maybe, Cocos, something like that, okay. So, uh, and I enjoy it uh, uh, all the time. So, what I'd like to do is talk to you about uh, trying to understand what cognitive aging is, and that has a, at least a semi-specific meaning. I, I've spent uh, the last year and a half on an Institute of Medicine committee that was commissioned to try to understand cognitive aging. Now, as I'll explain in a minute, this is not cognitive impairment, this is not dementia or Alzheimer's disease. This is uh, a change that occurs in older people bef before, if ever, those kinds of diseases with names and numbers actually begin and, uh, uh, and, and may or may not ever begin. So. Um, if, you, if you detect that I'm dancing a little bit, so I'm under oath not to reveal what's in that report, uh, which is still maybe uh, four or six weeks away. So I'm, I'll, I'll do what I can. The things I'm going to tell you are my own opinions or those that come from uh, uh, the published literature. Um, I, I, I know you're a very mixed audience. Some of this is technical. Uh, but I'll do my best, and I'm happy to have you uh, interrupt me at any time. And I, I, so I don't have any conflicts. And uh, let me just say a little bit in more detail about what this is about. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to try a little bit to give you a definition of cognitive aging. It's not very easy to do. I'm going to talk about how we think about cognition across the life course. Uh, I'm going to review adult and then early risk factors for late life cognitive aging. And then finally, I'm going to briefly summarize what, what's being done now and what might be done to try to help this. So in the end, the purpose of this is preventive medicine. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to start out, uh, this is a bit of a straw man, but I just wanted to uh, tell you that uh, uh, this is what a typical textbook picture of aging comes to. You, you start at some point normal, and then you, then you have this trajectory, which is very difficult to understand and measure. And some people have accelerated aging, which may or may not be also called diseases. It's hard to tell. And then you enter into a, a period of, of, of what's called in the trade frailty, which is really a risk state, and then finally you get frank disability and, uh, 
and physicians and preventists try their best to keep all of this from happening. But the reason I'm showing it to you is because I'm not, um, I'm not sure there's, an, in my own view, that there's enough of a biological basis for this, uh, at, at least as it's construed. So I want to, so let's peel off a layer, and this happens to be from a paper on lung function. It doesn't matter what organ, but just to move away from the brain for a moment. So first of all, this does a better job because at least it starts at birth, if not actually a little bit before. And it, and it looks at what normal aging is, whatever it is. That's the A curve. And then the B curve is um, if things happen in early, well, it could be even before conception, but at conception or during uh, gestation uh, or in childhood, infancy and childhood, um, something adverse happens and you never develop the kind of average lung function that this graph is trying to tell you. And then f finally, as an adult, they have a C curve, which is sometimes diseases intervene and, and, and lung function is worse. So I think this is getting a little bit closer. And most of the time that we spend, I, I do as an epidemiologist, are looking at adults. So we're looking at this range and trying to see what causes it and what we can do about it. So I promise to come back to cognition. So another conception of life course has um, actually looked at, uh, can you intervene in the general case? So this is your life course. This is getting chronic disease. And it makes an argument that, um, that if you intervene in a timely manner that you can get lower levels with the red arrow. With earlier intervention, you're more likely to get prevention than you are with late intervention. Well, I think as a physician, we're not you know, representing uh, health professions, as I'm in no way able to do, um, that we're never gonna stop trying to help people at any stage of their lives. But um, it, it, it may very well be in certain respects that development is the single most important time in terms of the long stretch, the long trajectory of, of uh, getting older. I also like this particular graph because it introduces uh, one of a few words that have crept into uh, the vocabulary of the, of, of the brain, and, and that is plasticity. That is the ability of the brain to adapt and adjust and the contention here is that plasticity is present throughout life, but really starts to get lower. And then there's an ad inadequate response to new challenges as you get older. That may or may not be true, but I think the real problem with this is that it, it, it's a great descriptive term, but it, it really, there's no physiologic basis for it, at least not yet. I think there will be one some days. So what life course epidemiology, which has been Oh, was started to be promulgated in the 70s, um, is to look, is to try to look at, at early life and see how it plays out in later life. That's very, very difficult to do, largely because it's very hard to go back and get the information, and we ask people to recall their childhoods, and then I'll, I'll come back to that. But it's, you know, I, I think everyone appreciates that that's hard to do. So, I'm sorry, this is, this is a graph from one of the earlier studies which looks at um, uh, the ponderosity index, that is how chubby you are or, or thin as, as an infant at birth, and what happens to your brain volume at, at age 75. And so these, this, these studies, a lot of which were done in Britain because they never seem to throw out any of their information. We do that all the time. But um, so they had uh, birth records and uh, looked, at, looked at birth weights and heights and, and uh, basically found that, that if, you, uh, if your ponderal index were high, was higher, then at 75 you had a larger brain volume. Now that's not the same as being able to think necessarily, but it, it probably is a correlate of that. So I'm just trying to give you a taste of what, how life course uh, uh, research and epidemiology um, actually started. 
Okay, so this is a very similar graph to what I started the lecture with, but this time it's from a, 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 a paper that wants to look at Alzheimer's disease. And, and, and um, my argument would be, so here's, here's what they show. So here's that aging curve. It's kind of inevitable and slow and smooth. And here's something, there's a preclinical, there's a preclinical something in here. So the question is if an older, if let's say a 60 year old has complaints about how well they think and they don't have a disease like, like uh, mild uh, cognitive impairment and they don't have a serious disease like dementia, the question is are these aging changes or is this a, almost the same but a preclinical dementing illness? Right now we really can't tell very easily although there's an awful lot of research being done on that. But I object, uh, as you'll see in a minute, I object to this uh, slide in a, in a number of uh, ways. So I, uh, this is hard to see, and it, and, and, but I wanted, to, I wanted to get some more color into my presentation. So, so people who have this disease called mild cognitive impairment, they have a cognitive complaint. That is, they complain to the doctor, if not to their families, that they have trouble thinking. And, and they're a set of criteria, and if there's memory, it's called, if there's a memory problem, it's called amnestic mild cognitive impairment or non-amnestic. And then it goes down into a series of classifications, and these have numbers, these have names and numbers. So this has been graced with being a disease, and this, this slide, which I just showed you, um, is, is caseness, so this has been named a case. Now, this has been argued, by the way, but, but I want you to know that once somebody is named a case of something, whether it's mild cognitive impairment or dementia, Alzheimer's disease, then, then they're no longer here, and the question is, what's going on here? And that's, that's, that's fairly uh, difficult to do. So it turns out, however, that cognitive function, that is measuring thinking, um, is really fairly diverse. It's diverse in a number of ways. One is you can see that if you take people who have been measured over a period of a few decades, and this isn't everybody, but because uh, nobody lasts that long in a study for a variety of reasons, you can see that cognition is all over the place. It goes up and down, and uh, uh, that needs to be understood, that there's no, there's no single thread that is just simply sinking. That isn't the way cognition works. And in fact, there is plasticity, and there is another word that's used, and that's resilience, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that in a second. So one of the problems for, for studying this in people, particularly in populations, is that there are all kinds of cognitive tests, and I've just listed 10 of them. I've shown, I found a slide that had 10 of them. Um, some of them are, uh, come from people who are lucky to have their name attached to it, Okay, so they can get copyright um, uh, privileges. And, uh, uh, but please note that while they're all sort of in the same direction, that the slope uh, over time is really different. For some of these, uh, like the pegboard test, uh, seems to change pretty quickly. Some of them, like uh, uh, the, the remembering a list of uh, 15 words, uh, really hangs in there pretty well. So cognition, cognition isn't one thing. It's, it's a variety of functions, and we all have different skills, different cognitive skills, different talents, different approaches to life, different adaptations, and this makes this very, very difficult to study and understand. So, so this is that same picture again. I put it back in because I wanted to show you some other objections I have to this other than the ones I've already told you. And so one is it assumes that there's a different biology of aging and disease. That's a cosmic uh, question uh, that, 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 but in my view, isn't really answered. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hear dissenting arguments uh, from the experts in the audience, but I, I don't personally believe that, that this has been worked out in most instances. Another problem that I have with this is, is that 
is that again, it assumes that you can tell aging from disease and, and, and for the reason I just told you, I don't think that's true. Another reason is that the trajectories of this, the smooth transition that I've, that I've just shown you, um, it, it, we, we know that's not true. So cognition goes up and down. I showed you that picture. But so you go to the hospital and you may have worse cognition. You heal up and you, and you get better. Uh, you, you, have, uh, uh, you take a drug that doesn't quite uh, work for you and you have cognitive problems and to stop it and you get better. Uh, you, you fracture your hip if, if, if that unfortunately happens and that may be a great stress and, and that may change things in a very sudden way. So this notion that everything happens smoothly is, is just simply not true and that has implications for how you prevent things because some things happen right away, um, acutely, and, and, and everybody who's thought about it knows that. Um, and then, and then a, a, another thing is that this, um, this starts out as if everybody were the same and at a high level. Okay, so that's, that's like all the kids at Lake Wobegon, all right? Uh, but um, in fact, uh, that's not true. Uh, development is as diverse as cognitive function across, and it's almost as if these pictures were intended to study the problem in full professors. Okay, so, so um, I, 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 I object to that in a number of ways. Um, and and, and from, a, from a public health perspective, I wanna say that, that there are a lot of people in society who have clinically clinically have intellectual deficits, okay? They never get into our population studies and they're pretty much ignored. Um, and a lot of them don't live to be 65 or 70 or 90. And I, I'm thinking of, uh, of infants born with Down syndrome, for example, is, is probably one of the classic. But there are a lot of, there, there, there's a lot of uh, people with intellectual deficits and again, I sort of object on moral grounds to th thinking of aging that starts at one high level and, uh, uh, and, and so forth, because that, that isn't who we are, um, um, in, in, in my view. Okay, so I want to step back for a second and say, well, how, wh what are we going to do with this cognitive aging thing, which doesn't have a start, and we can't tell it from early disease, and, and, and the cognitive tests are all over the place and they're hard to measure. And people who have a little problem with cognition don't wanna be in your study, okay? A lot of them are afraid. A lot of them are scared to actually find out the answers. And so that makes it even harder to find out what's going on. So, so, so here's what we do. So first of all, we do surveys that where we ask about do people have cognitive complaints? That is, do they perceive things that are wrong in themselves? Uh, and, and the answer is yes, that, we can do that, and people aren't too threatened by that, actually, relative to the testing. And, 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 and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which, which does national surveillance, national surveys of, uh, of older people, actually ask questions about how well do you, how well do you think your thinking is? You could do cognitive tests, but I've tried to argue, then the second thing, cognitive tests, but which ones? What, what's normal? Do we include the, uh, the unfortunate individuals with intellectual deficits? What, what do we do with that? I, I, nobody's figured that out yet. Um, and, and a third way we look at this is, so. all right, so people have complaints. Now, that, that complaint is a, you know, a clinical word. They're not carping. They're, they're, they, they say they have problems. And so the question is, what do we what do? We do? And, and, and the first thing we do is we ask them, well, what do you do about that? Well, okay, so I've got post-its all over myself. You know, I, 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 I adapt. I figure out ways to try to have better cognitive function. And, and so we, we'd like to know from a population perspective as to how people adapt to whatever disabilities or impairments they might have. And, 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 and that information, unfortunately, is not so much available. And then finally, we try to, we try to actually 
identify some functional consequences. If there is such a thing as cognitive aging, what's their dysfunction? Okay, so this is a busy slide like too many of mine. And I just wanted, I, I just uh, wanted to show you some of them. So uh, can you fill out your tax form? Do you lose words and names during conversation? Do you, can you download an app? Uh, uh, if any of these are true, don't worry, all right, because <laughs> it's going around. Um, um, I, I, I actually vote with an electronic machine, and I think it's kind of complicated <laughs> uh, to, to tell you the truth. Can you prepare a meal from a recipe? Can you get from Terminal E to Terminal C uh, uh, up at, uh, at Bush? Uh, and, and, and so, there, there are lots of ways, and the trouble is that it's different for different people who strike out into life in different ways, and so identifying cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive aging by looking at various functions um, is difficult to do. For those of you who study aging, I've tried to reinvent instrumental activities of daily living, and I'm, as you can see, I'm not doing very well, but I've, uh, I've been able to uh, uh, try to create a long list, okay, um, to try to, to try to do that. Okay, so I've been sort of giving you the epidemiologist dilemma. Um, the measures aren't clear. Uh, the populations that we study are not representative enough. And I think I'm gonna let some of this go because it, it gets into the weeds a little bit. But uh, suffice it to say that people again, often don't want to be bothered. Uh, it's harder to talk to people. You, know, the, you, you, you may know that, that in Iowa, there's an awful lot of uh, canvassing and sur political surveying because we, we have this uh, caucus every four years and nobody picks up the phone anymore because it just simply is not, uh, it, it's too bothersome and the person on the other end of the line likely has political questions. Um, and, 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 and so, in fact, the, the representativeness of the populations we're studying are, are just not like they used to be. Um, and then you have to exclude people who already have cognitive diseases, and there are at least 250 kinds of dementia. Um, and and uh, uh, again, it won't surprise you that to go back into childhood and even, even earlier, because people can bring with them things they were told about their infancy and childhood. Uh, it's very, very difficult to do, but we do it and sometimes it shows interesting things, but it's still hard to go back and there are no records and, and so on. How do you get good histories of genetics and familiality? Are things run in families? Again, very, very difficult to do. Well, I'm not sure that Aunt Gladys had that disease or not. You know, she died in 1920 and, and so, the information just isn't, uh, isn't really there. Um, and, then, and, and then finally, just to, to move this along, uh, some of the risk of, of Alzheimer's disease uh, versus cognitive aging, some of the risk factors are the same and, and, and they get mixed up. So I'm going to try to get a little bit more practical now, if I haven't been, and, and say, well, well look, oh, so, so here are the things that are likely not to give you cognitive aging because I haven't been able to put it in a box and give it a number and say, yes, you have it or you don't have it. But what I've tried to do is just to see whether there are differences in the trajectory. And so here's what we know, and I'm gonna do the life course, but I'm going to do it in reverse order, okay? I'm gonna start with older people. So nobody knows more than the geriatricians that there are an awful lot of clinical things that will cause cognitive change and, and cognitive decline. Uh, some of these are reversible, some of them aren't. Uh, uh, just things like kidney failure, liver dysfunction, heart attack, uh, strokes, sleep disorders, uh, uh, emphysema, um, having had general anesthesia at surgery, uh, at least temporarily changes cognitive function. Certain drugs like antihistamines, uh, anticholinergic, psychotropic drugs are associated with that. Uh, heart rhythm disturbance like atrial fibrillation has been clearly related to at least modest change in cognitive function. Um, forgive me. 
uh, psychiatric diseases like depression and bipolar disease clearly have abnormalities in cognitive function. The problem with all of that is that a lot of people with real mental illness also have substance abuse and the other thing that come along with all of that. And that's a confounder and that's very hard to understand because alcohol particularly and the consequences of problem drinking actually plays big in, in, in all of this. And then trauma, of course, and particularly from falling. Um, I had to get that in, Elena. So, uh, and, and, and sensory loss, uh, vision and hearing loss is, is probably related to cognitive change. So there are a lot of things that, if, that might be partially correctable or changeable. And I think the news, at least for some people, is very good. But this is, this is what doctors do, okay, for older people. And, and they should be doing it. They should be able to uh, actually look and see what, uh, what in fact is, is going on. So it's not surprising then that if you have a certain level of cognitive function, you're more likely, more, more cognitive dysfunction, you're more likely to uh, uh, be hospitalized because you have some of those conditions. And that, that, this is uh, two charts that basically show that. People who have lower cognitive function are more likely, the dotted line is more likely to go into the hospital. And, and, and so it, 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 it's, it's a way of predicting it's a way of showing what you could predict from looking at cognitive change and cognitive aging in older people. The question about smoking is a really tough one. So this is what's called a forest plot, and it tries to summarize lots of studies. And it looks like current smoking. I want to emphasize that uh, in this case, because current smoking is, is, is a tough business, and it has a lot of cognitive effects. But actually, it's not necessarily true of ever smoking versus never smoking. So in any case, this is a tough problem. I'll, I, maybe if I have a little bit of time, I'll come back to it. Because I think the smoking issue is critical because there are neurodegenerative diseases for which, believe it or not, there are some things that smoking doesn't cause. One of them is Parkinson's disease. All right. So there at least is a possibility that um, Smoking, I'm not arguing the smoke, please, please don't quote me. Um, I'm being recorded, I have the evidence. Uh, but, but smoking uh, uh, causes so many diseases, some of which in themselves will cause cognitive uh, dysfunction, that I'm not arguing that, but, it, but smoking is also a, a, a biological stress and sometimes we can learn from that and, um, and, and should. Uh, but the thing, this is another forest plot, and if, and if you look at all the studies, see they're all on this side of the line, and it basically shows that physical activity is maybe the best risk factor that one can think of to prevent cognitive aging, whatever that is, whatever, whatever you think it is. And, and, and that's the one where the, where the data are most plentiful, most consistent, and uh, I think it's a really good idea uh, all, all physical activity to the extent it can be done by younger and older people is probably uh, maybe the best thing. So, so I was going to show this to my technical colleagues, but I wanted to make a point um, that these are studies. So the ones that, the ones that show risk factors like caffeine and, uh, uh, well, homocysteine, uh, which, which I don't want to get into, um, uh, show that, that if you do longitudinal studies, that the data aren't so clear. Those are the black parts of these bars. Those are the studies that, that show this. And then if you do cross-sectional studies, if you just look at people at the same time, you, you actually see more, um, uh, you, you, you actually see more evidence, uh, more correlation. And so how you do the study matters. And the longer you follow people, the less some of these, uh, uh, some of these potential exposures matter. Antioxidants, um, alcohol, uh, smoking again, uh, which doesn't show up much here at all. Um, and, and, and other metabolic things, just the, the longer you follow people, the less it looks like that it's important. Even if they're continuing, continuing to be exposed 
to it. So this is a problem. Okay, so I've shown you what, there, there are a lot of interesting things that can be done for some people, for some older people, and, 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 and should be done, in a, and it's a part of medical practice, and it's a part of prevention. But let's go back now. I told you I was gonna do this backwards. And uh, let's look at, at uh, late youth through middle age. Uh, not studied very much by the epidemiologists, uh, unfortunately, and all I have is the one slide, but I wanna make the point that uh, there are occupational exposures, chemicals, pesticides, air pollution, um, recreational substances and drugs, uh, traumatic brain injury, which has been in the news a lot, I mean, in the military and uh, uh, the NFL. Uh, uh, traumatic brain injury is a really important and proven cause of cognitive change. And, and, and important psychiatric conditions, as I've said already, are also very important, things that manifest themselves, usually by the time uh, an individual gets to be 25 years of age, if they're going to have serious psychiatric illness, it will usually start to manifest itself by then. And so the, the reason to put this in, I'm not gonna give you a longer list, but to know these are important, and for those of you who are interested in careers and trying to figure out what's going on here, People with these conditions need to be followed longitudinally. They need to be followed into old age. And that simply is not done and, and needs to be done so we can understand whether, whether the insults to the brain that occur with all of this, in fact, are, are, are lifelong and going to change the shape of that curve, okay, as we get into uh, uh, cognitive aging. So this has to do with the dose and the anatomy and the early care. And, 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 and we just need to find all of this out. And I'm just surprised how, how little literature there is on all of this. Okay, I wanna spend a little bit more time with youth. And so one thing that, that the social scientists and the epidemiologists believe is that um, education relates to all of this. And I was talking to the trainees this morning, and I was basically trying to question that a little bit. Um, there's a really good paper, I've, I've got the citation, and I just wanted to quote from it. Uh, here's a woman, uh, a distinguished investigator from Britain who's, uh, whose name is Brain, actually. It's spelled a little bit different, so uh, I hope she can live with that, okay? But, but more education did not protect individuals from developing neurodegenerative and vascular diseases by the time they died. Uh, I'm sorry, did not protect them. Uh, but it did appear to mitigate the impact of the pathology on how they function. So whether you get the changes of, of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, if you had more education, it seemed, uh, it seemed to, to, you seemed to be better off with the same amount of, of pathology. And so there's, there's, there's this disaggregation that I'm gonna have to leave for now. You can ask questions about it if you'd like. And this led to the notion of brain resilience. And, and I just want to describe one study. So the way, uh, the way to study whatever resilience is, is to look at head trauma. So people who have, in, in midlife, who have had um, the same brain trauma, often from auto accidents, might have been in the military, uh, there are other causes. And if they, if they, were, if they had a real head injury and, and the x-rays look the same, the damage is the same, the neurologic findings are the same, the people who had more education functioned better, okay, with that same level of, uh, of injury. So there's something going on here that's just not pathology. And, and, and that's one of the mysteries of education. And the reason I think it's so important is that we spend a lot of our money and a lot of our parenting skills on trying to educate our children and, and hoping they can be the, the best that they can be, but it, it raises how much schooling is enough, how much parenting is enough, um, how hard should society promote formal education. I, I think these are incredible policy issues that, that are being hung on this, and I don't think we quite know. I'm, I'm not arguing, again, against going to school. I'm arguing that it's not clear what we get back from this in terms of the long-term trajectories of, uh, of cognition. So what are, what are we trying to do about it? So one of the, 
this, these are study things. So what we're trying to do is not just count how many years of education you've had, but we're trying to develop questionnaires that, that, that peel off layers and ask older adults what school was like and hopefully they can remember. So did they drop out of school? Uh, did they change schools because of learning problems? Uh, were they ever, uh, did they ever get private tutoring? Uh, uh, was there a specific problem? Uh, in any of the, the three R's and uh, smoke, uh, sp speaking in language. So, uh, and, and, and then something which has been recognized, I think, more and more that if you have 12 years of education as a high school graduate, if you got a GED, general education degree, your, your function is very different than, than if you got a regular uh, high school diploma. And, and, and so we're, we're trying to make sense out of all of this and to look back and see what, see what the cognitive function and learning abilities of kids were back when maybe it matters uh, uh, the most. And um, so another area where there's been a lot of research has been, well, what was your childhood environment like? And this is a very difficult question. It's difficult uh, emotionally to ask somebody well, when you were a child, you didn't have enough to eat. Um, did people in your family use words about you like stupid, lazy, and ugly? Uh, I had to well wear dirty clothes. So there are positive things here too, like I felt loved. Um, uh, did your parents, uh, did you ever hear them say that you wish you had never been born? Um, wow, so that, that, that's pretty tough stuff. And, um, I'm not even sure we could get away with asking questions like this, but uh, one, I think there are a number of investigators with good reason who would like to go back and would like to be able to ask questions like this to sort of know if those things really mattered and if so, how much. Those are very, very tough and, and, and difficult questions and, and I, I'm struggling with some of these questions uh, now. Um, in my own uh, in my own surveys, so the question then is: um, Is there anything positive about stimulating activities? And the answer is yes, and it relates to how you function and stimulating social engagement. Uh, positive things. Positive things are also correlated with better cognitive function. Um, it's just so hard to document them, and it, and in fact, it's really. Um, in, in, in fact, been a problem. So I, I, I'm going to tell you a, a research direction um, that I'm going in, and, and it, hopefully um, it's a way of getting past this. How do you remember what things were like 70 years ago? And, and, and one of the ways, it's not the only way and maybe not the best way, but we try to identify uh, people who have uh, learning disorders, brain disorders that we know occur in childhood, and I've listed them for you, uh, AD, uh, you know, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, language disorders, conduct that is behaving badly, um, autism spectrum, substance abuse, things that people might recall, uh, trouble with words, dyslexia, and reading. Um, not because this is all about diseases, but because these conditions, all of which have been studied cognitively very well and have been studied with imaging, um, and, uh, and they have a lot in common with each other. Uh, they're, they're common enough to study. They, uh, uh, they're associated with psychiatric illness. They have uh, brain imaging abnormalities. Uh, and uh, um, I, I think it's an approach. And one of the things that's been done for example, is that there's been one elder survey now that have actually asked adults, um, older adults, um, about ADHD. And, and the question, and, and, and I think with, with really interesting findings. So how do you ask an adult if, if they fidget? All right. And the answer is, it's hard, but there are a set of questions that come from the classic descriptions of the disease. And I've just given you one question. So. Uh, one, one of each of the two dimensions of ADHD in adults. Do you often fail to give close attention to detail or do you make mistakes in work uh, or, or during other activities? That would be the attention problem. And then the hyper 
activity and the impulsivity is, do you often move your feet in a restless manner or do you fidget in your chair? And you may have seen me pacing a little bit and I'm worried now. Um, but um, so, so there are criteria for all of this. And I think if one could identify the childhood named illnesses that have known neuroanatomic and known problems in adulthood, we may be able to find something about whether this matters in terms of cognitive function and whether it even matters in terms of cognitive uh, diseases, okay, that may have started at birth or even before birth. Uh, and, and, and I think it's a handle on it. It's not, uh, again, the only way to do it. So even NIH is coming around to this, and I sort of like the, the graphic, but the National Institute of Drug Abuse just announced the other day that uh, they're starting a long cohort study of imaging of children to, uh, to try to see what happens to their brains across time. And, and so this, this is not uh, whimsical anymore. This, this is actually, I think, where mainline research is going. So I'm going to finish with well, what can we do about this uh, uh, other than what I told you about older people. Okay, so, so the first thing is we need to support all kinds of research. And, and uh, I know we, all us scientists say that, but I, I, th I think uh, there are a lot of interesting leads and we should be doing it. Um, we also need a working definition of clinical, uh, uh, of, it should be cognitive aging actually. Uh, uh, whether it's for populations or for doing surveillance in public health or for intervention studies, we need to be able to just say you have it or you don't, at least with a certain amount of assurance so that we can study it. Because if it's just a phenomenon that changes gradually over, over years and decades, then it's going to be very, very difficult to study. Um, as I said a, a little while ago, we need to follow up the insults that happen to the brain early in life and follow up what happens to them. We've got to start doing it. We've got to start taking the NFL players and the soldiers and, and, and all the auto accident victims and, and, and who have real brain injury and see what happens to their cognition over time. We, we just simply need to do that uh, until, um, until we've done it for 40 or 50 years and, 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 and really see what happens. Um, we need to uh, uh, work on prevention programs that, that I've suggested where there is evidence and uh, uh, there's not enough of that. Uh, so there have been treatments and so-called preventives um, and, and I'm thinking of two uh, uh, drugs that promote uh, learning and none more, more than uh, caffeine, okay. Uh, that's all of our drug. And, or many of us anyway, and then brain games. And, and, and I'm not going to go there particularly. I think my colleagues um, around the world have signed petitions suggesting that, uh, that they're, they're just not ready yet. It's not that they're wrong or right, actually. It's just that they're not ready to actually change how people think across the board by doing games and interventions. I, I'm, I'm not arguing for or against them, but I, I think most of my colleagues believe, uh, um, in, in fact, that it's pretty early. So, and then the last study that I'm going to show you is one that was in science a few months ago. Uh, and so it's a plea to follow the strengths and weaknesses of all research. So this is yet one more study of putting mice on a treadmill and seeing how they do. And this time they were measuring how many new cells got into the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain that's related to memory and other, and, and, and other things. And I've just stolen the, uh, the title from, from this science article. And what they found, unfortunately, was that exercise creates more cells. They're new nerve cells that come to this part of the brain that remembers, but it caused the mice to forget. Um, Okay, and, and I don't know how you, well, I do know what the study showed, but it's, it's very hard to understand whether a mouse is forgetting or not. It, it, it's, a, it, it, it's, a difficult, uh, it's a difficult issue. Um, so um, it, it, it's really important, that, so mice aren't people, and everyone's, everyone knows that, uh, 
But you've got to follow the research carefully to begin to understand what works and what doesn't work and the clues that we can get from uh, um, research in other species. Okay, so I started out by saying that there's a report coming from the Institute of Medicine. It's called Gray Matters. Uh, how's that for a pun? Uh, uh, cognitive Health and Aging, and it, uh, again, it'll be out in six weeks, and it'll give you a lot more information and uh, a lot more wisdom than, than, I, than I think I've given you. So, so uh, you can look for that. You can download it for free when it, uh, uh, when it comes, and, and, and so thank you. So I have, one, I have one more thing I wanted to say. Remember that uh, uh, I've been coming here since 1992, we figured out, Cocos, and, uh, and again, as he, he calculated, I was probably, I've probably been here 15 times, but um, still, it's a pleasure. Um, I've had great friends, great colleagues, uh, great experiences, great dinners, um, and uh, uh, I just wanted to say that it, that, that it really has been a, a privilege and, uh, and I really do appreciate it. And so thank you very much. So thank you so much for this wonderful uh, uh, presentation about uh, right now. So if there's time for some questions, so if anybody has questions. Go ahead, we'll let Dr. Lefebvre go. Um, thank you for the presentation. That was a pretty good comprehensive overlook, you know, the different research that's been done on aging. But uh, one area that I'm really intrigued with, with research is um, mind-body connection. And I, I think that seems like a lacking element, you know, especially in U.S. culture is just, you know, um, developing a relationship between your mind-body because the, the body often communicates to you, you know, what's going on and, you know, understanding what the body is experiencing. But anyways, I know that they've done research on aspects like Tai Chi, Qigong, and um, specifically for the aging population with uh, balance, balance and preventing falling. So um, any comments or... But this is the area I'm fascinated with. So I understand that, and I basically uh, agree. I, I, I think, at least with respect to older people, we're looking at mind-body interactions, and they're hard to study, but, but uh, I, I think we're almost there. Uh, 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 tai Chi and Qigong and, and other interventions are used. They're, 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 part, of the, uh, uh, they're part of the program. And, and so I, I, th I think there will be convergence. It's not what I study, uh, but I think we will, we will understand better with that. I, I have no quarrel with that whatsoever. Uh, Jim, I'm sorry, you were... Well, I, I was just wondering, uh, given the limitations of the U.S. in terms of data, um, why you would want to propose lifelong data <laughs> I mean, we're not all that different from countries that do have data, and and uh, and we, we do get kind of insular. I mean, now I mean, obviously, but, but we do get kind of insular about these issues, and, and there just seems to be a heck of a lot better data from you know from some of the European countries that that, that uh, keep their data. I think th I think what some European countries have is a lot. They've retained a lot of birth data. A few places have retained clinical records military. all the way through. Uh, we have you know, good military records, actually, and, and they're getting better because the VA was the first place to do you know, really do electronic medical records well. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I think it, you know, Europeans and other developed, you know, other developed countries will do that, but I think we're probably not far behind because I think it's this great gap uh, in uh, childhood and substance use and occupational exposures. It's that great middle of our lives that nobody's paid any attention to. And I don't think the Europeans really have much of that. And it's very difficult to do, and I understand that. But I think, there's, I think there's a lot of room for doing things in the United States. We're just kind of behind in certain ways. I, I, I agree with that, too. 
Yeah. Has there been any data developed over the uh, correlation between long-term exercise, that is beginning in middle age or younger, and continuous, not, not waiting until you get to be old, and cognitive development? So, so long-term exercise runners, for example, uh, there's been there's been a lot of research, and it's not easy to come to a conclusion. Uh, a lot of exercise, for example, in older people, can be healthful in many ways. It could also lead to falls, and that's been that's been demonstrated. So I think I think it comes down to the choices of the kinds of exercise that people do and how much care uh, that that you do when you do it. But I it, it still both as an intervention and as a correlate, it's still the best single intervention we have right now. You mentioned two different types of education, the GED and the regular uh, schooling. How about homeschooling? Is there any data? Yeah, that's a great question. So I put homeschooling in with all the other ways in which we try to take care of our kids. And I think they're probably, that, needs, that question needs to be answered. Uh, again, there are a lot of issues about growing up and, and being intellectually competent and all of that that I'm not talking about. I'm talking about what happens in the long term and whether homeschooling, I think homeschooling is enough of an intervention in the way we educate our kids that we need to know that. But I put that in with all the others that we don't know much about the long term. I, I agree with that. That's a good thought. Yes? Does your work find that diabetics are at higher risk or cognitive decline? They are. On balance, diabetics... ...is becoming diabetic at an earlier age. It may become it's, an issue. It, it's true, and, and, and there are any number of reasons to try to take care of our diabetics and, present, and prevent it. Uh, but but if, if, if the population gets more obese and gets more glucose intolerant, uh, that's going to be a problem. Wine and cheese session. Absolutely. <laughs> UTMB Health. Working together to work wonders.